Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day and thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. Lord, as uh, we share in thy word, I just pray that uh, you may guide our mind and uh, we may think of these things that uh, will bring us life and unto our families, that we may not perish but live, Lord. Help us to use the knowledge we have in the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. And so welcome once again to the Family Life series. Uh, we had uh, posted and uh, did uh, some presentations on uh, uh, another series, that is the Dress Reform. But now we are back to the Family Life, and I pray that uh, we shall be blessed by this presentation. If uh, there is uh, an institution that uh, the devil knows that he can use successfully to be set uh, the knowledge of God and uh, the knowledge of Christ. It is in the uh, family life uh, uh, institution. And this is not a new thing, but uh, he has used this institution since the book of uh, Genesis to bring about uh, uh, a problem, a problem of sin. And today he is just repeating the same things but if uh, we can get uh, the marriage institution back working, then we know that we can have a healthy church. He knows that when he doesn't have a healthy uh, home and a healthy family, then uh, we will not have healthy churches because churches are a product of uh, uh, home fellowships. When um, the families who are in Christ meet in a church level, then we have a church but then religion begins at home. And that is why I have entitled uh, presentation number seven, the, 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 home, uh, uh, the home religion, and how I pray that um, this uh, will be uh, a blessing unto us. Now, I, I just want us to see how the enemy has tried to destroy the family foundation. I want us to try and see how the enemy has tried to destroy the family foundation. But uh, praise be unto God because um, he is in the business of restoring this institution. He is in the business of restoring uh, this institution so that uh, it may be used for the glory and honor of his name. Now, home religion, but uh, as it has been, Babylon has been seeking to make sure that uh, there is no families. And uh, in making sure that there is no families, he is trying to do away with the church and religion. In the system of Babylon and the festivities, let us look at how the enemy wanted to interfere with religion completely. This question was then, as it always has been, very far-reaching. When the right was claimed to worship according to the dictates of uh, conscience, in that was claimed the right to disregard all the Roman laws of the subject of religion and to deny the right of, sta of the state to have anything whatever to do with the question of religion. But this, according to the Roman estimate, was only to be defiance to the state and to the interest of society altogether. The Roman state, so intimately and intricately connected with religion, was but the reflection of the character of the Roman people, who prided themselves upon being the most religious of all nations. And Cicero commended them for this because of their religion was carried in, into all the details of life. And so it reached a place in the Roman Empire that um, the state had to interfere with what was happening at the family level. Now, this was Babylon, this was Rome, but using the state to interfere with the family affairs so that they may be able to control how the family worships. We continue reading that um, um, the Roman ceremonial worship, and uh, here is where I am, uh, the Roman ceremonial worship was very elaborate and minute, applying to every part of daily life. It consisted in sacrifices, prayers, festivals, and uh, investigations by augeries and uh, horispices of the will of the gods and the cause of the future events. 
And so their religion centered upon their goals, their different goals and uh, uh, what part of life they played in the home life. The Romans accounted themselves an exceedingly religious people because their religion was so intimately connected with the affairs of home and state. Just think about that, that this being a state, uh, it accounted itself very religious because their religion was so intimately connected with the affairs of home and state. So it was not just a matter of uh, the state, but also the home was a very important uh, place for the Roman government. Thus, religion everywhere met the public life of the Roman by its festivals and laid an equal yoke on his private life by, by its uh, requisition of sacrifices, prayers, and orgies. All pursuits must be conducted according to a system carefully laid down by the College of Pontiffs. So even at home life, what led you was, was what was laid down by the College of Pontiffs. There is no place they didn't interfere with, whether it be state, whether it be home, whichever thing it was interfered with uh, uh, the Roman uh, Empire. If a man went out to walk, there was a form to be recited. If he mounted on a chariot, another. This is James Freeman Clark, and uh, it is being quoted by uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones in uh, 1891 in this uh, uh, masterpiece, uh, The Two Republicans, page uh, 149, paragraph 1. Now, but this whole system of religion was false. The gods which they worshipped were false gods. Their gods, in short, were but reflections of themselves. And the uh, ceremonies of worship were but the exercise of their own passions and lusts. Neither in their gods nor their worship was there a single element of good. Therefore, upon it all, Christianity taught the people to turn their backs. The Christian doctrine declared all these gods to be no gods and all the forms of worship of the gods to be only idolatry and uh, a denial of the only true God, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The two Republicans, page 149, paragraph two. And so if you accepted the rulership of this empire, you were under a false system, not only in uh, stately matters, but also in religious matters. But uh, people had no choice uh, of what to do because once they ruled the place that you are living in, then they could interfere with everything that you are doing. Continued on. The games and all the festival days were affairs of the state and were an essential part of the cheerful devotion of the pagans and the gods were supposed to accept. As the most grateful offering, the games that the prince and people celebrated in honor of their peculiar festivals. This is Gibbon and uh, being quoted by uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones in the two, two the two Republicans, page 150. And so... These innocent things that people go to watch, I say innocent in quotes because they are innocent. They are only innocent when you are ignorant about them. These games of that time were dedicated to their gods, which was just paganism and nothing but paganism. And mark you, everyone had to attend these games. Along the Trevor continues to say, the festivities of the wedding and the ceremonies of the funeral were all conducted under the protection of the gods. More than this, the number of the gods was as great as the number of the incidents in earthly life. That is Mom Momsen. The pagan's domestic heart was guarded by the penates or by the ancestral gods of his family or tribe. By land, he traveled under the protection of one tutela divinity by sea of another, the bath, the bridal, the funeral had each it is presiding date. Now, pause a minute from there. Why did these people have to interfere with home affairs? Because in every tribe, there was a God who was in charge of that tribe. And so for you not to align with the religion of the people, the popular people there, it was to invite a curse to that tribe. And that is why you had to be monitored so closely at a family level to make sure that uh, you are not doing anything that was against their gods. That is why families were watched to know what they were doing so that a curse may not come upon the tribe. This was pagan. It is pagan still today, and it will forever be paganism. Continued on, we read that um, 
By land, he traveled under the protection of one of the titular divinity, by sea of another, the bath, the bridal, the funeral, had it is, each it is presiding deity. The very commonest household utensils and implements were cast into mythological forms. He could scarcely drink without being reminded of making a libation to the gods. That is Milman speaking. All this heathen ceremony, Christianity taught the people to renounce, and everyone did renounce it who became a Christian. But let us see, when they renounce this form of uh, 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 governorship and uh, religion, what followed next? Because we see that they were interfering with family affairs, and the reason for interfering with family affairs so that we may not have a true religion. Remember, True religion is based upon the true foundation of a family. And so when a family is destroyed, then you don't have a true foundation of a true church. That is why paganism and Roman uh, 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 rulership interfered with the family so that uh, it may interfere with the true religion. Sometimes we wonder why we have what is called the dark ages. It was dark, not only because people were kept in superstitions, but uh, people were kept in ignorance of the word of God and they were not allowed to own a Bible or to read the Bible for themselves. Other than what the pontiff said that the family should do, there was no one who was educated to be able to read the Bible for themselves. And so this was the affairs of the Dark Ages. But today we are not faced with the Dark Ages as it were back in the years of uh, 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 16th centuries and uh, the 1260 years of uh, people's supremacy. But um, we are facing a dark age of misinformation that uh, all you have to do is be in misinformed and then you have a false religion. It is just paganism which have worn another garb of uh, uh, clothing. And so uh, Reformation taught the people to learn these uh, things, but so intricately, I want you to see this, but so intricately was the idolatry interwoven into all the associations of both public and private life, of both state and social action, that it seemed impossible to escape the observance of them without at the same time renouncing the commerce or mankind, of mankind and all the offices and amusements of the society. Yet with any of its two, Christianity did not compromise. So the issue is this. If you left this form of religion, then you are in danger of not even having any commerce with anyone, of not associating with anyone. Because once you left this religion, you are deemed as a traitor. And then you could not be allowed to buy or sell from the people who practiced this uh, uh, religion and this form of government. Now, these things we are reading right now, but they are going to come back uh, just before Christ comes back. Every Christian, merely by the profession of Christianity, severed himself from all the gods of Rome and everything that was done in their honor. He could not attend a wedding or a funeral of his nearest rel relatives. This is how serious these things were, that if you wanted to leave the Roman religion completely, you could not attend a wedding or a funeral of the nearest relative because every ceremony was performed with reference to the gods. He could not attend the public festival for the same reason, nor could he escape by absenting himself on such occasions. So if you did not attend, you were watched closely, you were uh, investigated. There were people who were to make sure that uh, you attended these things. But if you absented yourself, it was also reported that you did not attend these things. But to attend them was detrimental to your, uh, 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 to your conscience because all these things were performed in honor of the gods of paganism. So reformers could not attend the funerals of their relatives or the wedding of their relatives because of that reason but as they absented themselves they were watched closely so he could not attend the public festival for the same reason nor he nor could he escape by absenting himself on such occasions 
because on days of public festivity, the doors of the houses and the lamps about them and the heads of the dwellers therein must all be adorned with laurel and garlands of flowers in honor of the licentious gods and goddesses of Rome. Very serious issues on family life. If the Christian took part in these services, he paid honor to the gods as did the other heathen. If he refused to do so, which he must do if he would obey God and honor Christ, he made himself conspicuous before the eyes of the people, of all of whom were intensely jealous of the respect they thought due to their gods, and also in so refusing the Christian disobeyed the Roman law which commanded these things to be done. So if you absent yourself from the funeral or the wedding of your relative, this was another mode of breaking the Roman law. And so we see a time when family life was faced with difficulties. We talk of difficulties that families have, but we shall see that these people had a lot of difficulties to face. All this subjected the Christian to universal hatred. And as the laws positively forbade everything that the Christian taught both with reference to the gods and to the state, the forms of law furnished a ready channel through which this hatred found them. This was the open way for the fury of the populace to spend itself upon the deniers of the gods and enemies of the Caesars and of the Roman people. And this was the source of the persecution of Christianity by pagan Rome. This interference with family was the source of the persecution of Christianity by pagan Rome. And so... Let us look at the reign of spiritual and emotional tyranny in dark ages, the send the law of 17th century, how they interfered with the family. We have not to go back very far into the past to find the information sought, nor are we obliged to turn to Roman Catholic lands. Indeed, those most active in national reform work are the descendants of the old Scottish Covenanders, and it is the Scottish Covenant, a theory of government which they are seeking to establish in this country. That theory was once well established in Scotland. And very interesting to enlighten people in this age is the record of the proceedings under it. That record may be found in the Barcol history of civilization. First, however, by the way of introduction, we quote the following from the Encyclopedia Britannica article, Presbyterianism, February 20, 1896, by A.T. Jones. Um, and... Um, uh, I just have to show you something. Uh, this is... Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, I'll continue reading on. We read that... Um, for the spiritual, for the spiritual turn in which they, the Covenanters introduced the reader, should refer to Mr. Buckle's famous chapter, or if he thinks those statements to be partial or exaggerated to original records, such as those of the Presbyterian, Presbyterian of St. Andrew St. Cuba. The arrogance of the ministers, pretensions, and the readiness with which these pretensions were granted, the appealing conceptions of the date which were inculcated and the absence of all contrary expression of opinion, the intrusions on the domain of the magistrate, the vexations, interference in every detail of family and commercial life and the patience with which it was born are to an English reader alike amazing. We acknowledge, said they, that according to the latitude of uh, the word of God, which is our theme, we are allowed to treat in an ecclesiastical way of greatest and smallest from the king's throne that should be established in righteousness to the merchant's balance that should be used in faithfulness. The liberality of the interpretation given to this can only be judged after a minute reading. And so Alonso Trevor Jones continues to say, uh, turning now to Barcol's famous chapter, chapter five, of his history of civilization, we found the following notes in brackets being from Buckle's footnotes in proof of his uh, statements. Now, I, I, li I like to read uh, this story. Uh, 
I'd like just to read this story that uh, traces the Roman, uh, the Scottish Inquisition. Uh, and uh, how it was uh, conducted the the scottish scottish inquisition and uh, how it was conducted we read according to the presbyterian polity which reached its height in the 17th century the clergyman of the parish selected a certain number of laymen on whom he could depend and who under the name of elders were his counselors or rather the ministers of his authority. They, when assembled together, formed what was called the Kirk Session. And this little court, which enforced the decisions uttered in the pulpit, was so supported by the superstitious reverence of the people that it was far more powerful than any civil tribunal. By its aid, the minister became supreme. For whoever presumed to disobey him was excommunicated, was deprived of his, of his property, and was believed to have incurred the penalty of eternal perdition. Now, th 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 these were those days, and you will say that um, we are living in a, a very civilized world, and uh, such a things can never happen. But I, I wanted to be keen in what we are going to read, uh, this is uh, in uh, uh, American, uh, the American uh, Sentinel. We are reading from the American Sentinel. I want us to see what E.T. Jones says about these things, how the church and the state controlled their family affairs until there was no liberty at all at family level. So anyone who incurred uh, their censure they were deprived of their property and they incurred a, penal, a penalty of eternal perdition. This is American Sentinel, page 60, paragraph 6. Look at the powers that the clergy had. The clergy interfered with every man's private concerns, ordered how he should govern his family, and often took upon themselves the personal control of his household. Clarendon, under the year 1640, emphatically says, the preacher reprehended the husband, governed the wife, chastised the children, and insulted over the servants in the houses of the greatest men. This is in note 26. Their minions, the elders, were everywhere, for each parish was divided into several quarters, and to each quarter one of these officials was allotted in order that he might take special notice of what was done in his own district. Besides this, spies were appointed so that nothing could escape their supervision. Sunday observance was enforced in a manner which to even the strictest national reformer would have been unexceptionable. So this is the control of family and the institution of the Sunday law in the years, back in the year 1640s. The power of the preacher. The preacher was exalted to a position which in the public mind must have been but little short of the place of deity. To him, the minister, all must listen and him all must obey. Without the consent of his tribunal, no person might engage himself either as a domestic servant or as a field laborer. If anyone incurred the displeasure of the clergy, they did not scruple to summon his servants and force them to state whatever they know respecting him and whatever they had seen done in his house. To speak disrespectively of a preacher was a grievous offense. To differ from him was a heresy, even to pass him in the street without saluting him was punished as a crime. His very name was regarded as sacred and not to be taken in vain. This is blasphemy because this is against the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. And that it might be properly protected and held in a due honor, an assembly of the church in 1642 forbade it to be used in any public paper unless the consent of the holy man had been previously obtained. This is how powerful the clergy were, and they had appointed men all over the villages to just uh, 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 be sure that your house was following the regulations of the church in those days. And this was a hard time 
for the reformers. Now, we say that these times will never come to us, but they are coming. We are told that history will repeat itself. Continued on to reading in uh, American Sentinel, the arbitrary and uh, irresponsible tribunals, which now sprang up all over Scotland, united the executive authority with the legislative and exercised both functions at the same time, declaring that certain acts not, ought not to be committed. They took the law into their own hands and punished those who had committed them. According to the principles of this new jurisprudence, of which the clergy were the authors, it became a sin for any Scotchman to travel in Catholic country. It was sin for any Scotch innkeeper to admit a Catholic into his inn. It was a sin for any Scotch town to hold a market either on Saturday or on Monday because both days were near Sunday. This is how sacredly Sunday, sacredness was guarded. That you could not go to market on Saturday, nor could you not go on Monday because those days were near Sunday and Sunday was very sacred. And so your family was watched very closely. Now, I have a reason why I'm going through this history because we shall find that uh, this kind of um, uh, regime made sure that it did away with religion. And so what does this have to do with us? We are reading this history so that we may come now to the real matter, preparation of the home before the crisis. We are told, it was seen, it was a sin for a Scotch woman to wait at a tavern. It was a sin for her to live alone. It was also a sin for her to live with unmarried sisters. Now think about this, that it was seen for a sister, a Scotch woman to live alone. So she had to be living with somebody. It was also seen for her to live with unmarried sisters. Very interesting. It was a sin to go from one town to another on Sunday, however pressing the business might be. It was a sin to visit your friend on Sunday. On that day, horse exercise was sinful, so was walking in the fields or in the meadows or in the streets or enjoying the fine weather by sitting at the door of your own house. So if on Sunday you come out of your house to just enjoy the sun, it was sin. This was a Sunday law back in the 16th century. And we are reading from American Sentinel by Alonzo Trevor Jones, 1896. Um, again, we are told to go to sleep on Sunday before the duties of the day were over, that is uh, worshipping, was also sinful and deserved church censor. This is the records of the CAC session of Aberdeen in 1656. Um, and this have the, uh, the, the, the end, this has that end. At the CAC, the prayer... Prayers averaged nearly two hours in length and the sermons about three hours and a half. So uh, when you went to church on Sunday, there were prayers for two hours in length and this, then the sermon took three hours and a half. Those are five hours and a half without you turning, without you getting out of the church, without a child raising its voice or whatsoever thing. Look, yet it was a great sin even for the children to become tired before the service was ended. Five and a half hours, a small child is seated listening to prayers and sermons. Halibaton, addressing the young people of his congregation, says, Have not you been glad when the Lord's day was over, or at least when the preaching was done, that he might get your liberty? Has it not been a burden to you to sit so long in the church? Well, this is a great sin. If you said it was long, it, uh, if you say you were tired of the preaching or sitting long hours in the church, it was done what? It was a great sin. The interference of family life by the clergy in dark ages. Heresy or pretended liberty of conscience was the crime of crimes and to be punished accordingly. So people who are today saying that we want liberty of conscience, you prepare for the crisis ahead of us. But as one brother says, we have nothing to fear if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can only fear if we do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is why I'm presenting this history so that we may have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When these things start happening, we shall not be moved 
or we shall not deny our faith. They taught that it was sin to tolerate his, the heretic's, notions at all, and that the proper course was to visit him with sharp and immediate punishment. Going yet further, they broke the domestic ties and set parents against their offspring. They taught the, farmer, the father to smite the unbelieving child and to slay his own boy sooner than to allow him to propagate error. So anyone who did not adhere to that religion, the father... If it was a child, the father was told to kill this boy. As if this were not enough, they tried to extirpate another faction, even more sacred and more devoted still. They laid their rude and uh, merciless hands on the holiest passion of which our nature is capable, the love of a mother for her son. Into that sanctuary, they dared to intrude. Into that, they thrust their grand and ungentle forms. If a mother held opinions of which they disapproved, they did not scruple to invade her household, take away her children, and forbid her to hold communion with them. If you disbelieve what they taught, your children were taken away. Or if, perchance, her son had incurred their displeasure, they were not satisfied with forcible separation, but they labored to corrupt her heart and harden it against her child so that she might be private to the act. In one of these cases mentioned in the records of the Church of Glasgow, the card session of that town summoned before them a woman, merely because she had received into her own house her own son after the clergy had excommunicated him. So effectually did they work upon her mind that they induced her to promise not only that she would shut her door against the child, but that she would aid in bringing him to punishment. She had sinned in loving him. She had sinned even in giving him shelter, but, says the record, she promised not to do it again and to tell the magistrate when he comes next, next to her. She promised not to do it again. She promised to forget him whom she had borne over her womb and circled at her breast. She promised to forget her boy who had often times crept to her knees and had slept in her bosom. And whose tender frame she had watched over and nursed to hear of such a things is enough to make one's blood surge again and raise a tempest in our inmost nature. So they removed all the affections of the mother from the child because the child had incurred their censure. But to have seen them, we have to have seen them, to have lived in the midst of them, and yet not to have rebelled against them is to us is to us utterly inconceivable and proves in how complete a thraldom the scotch were held, and how thoroughly their minds as well as their bodies were enslaved. So, what more need I say? What further evidence need I bring to elucidate the real character of one of the most detestable tyrannies ever seen on the earth? When the scotch cock was at the height of its power, we may search history in vain for any institution which can compete with it, except the Spanish Inquisition. Between these two, there is a close and intimate analogy. Both were intolerant, both were cruel, both made war upon the finest parts of human nature, and both destroyed every vestige of religious freedom. And so, it may be said, of course, that all this was back in the 17th century when men were, when men, uh, when uh, men were narrow and bigoted in their ideas and intolerant in matters of religion. Yes, that was the 17th century when men were begotten and self-opinionated and revengeful and hated others who differed from them and lasted for power in both civil and spiritual affairs. And this is the 19th century when human nature is exactly the same that it was then. Today, men are narrow-minded, begotten, full of prejudices and passions and as eager to obtain power and to use it for any purpose they may see fit as they ever were in the past. Let the National Reform Party, this is a posted Protestantism party, succeed. Let there be a resurrection of the Scottish Covenanta or the papal power theory of government in this land of America and other parts of the world. And there will be a chapter in our national history parallel to that in Scotland's history to which we have referred. And so we are headed to a place where uh, if the home religion is not going to be made strong when the 
papal power against power, we will see the religion of Christ done away with. And so what we need is a preparation of our children at such a time as this, so that um, when they come in contact with the enemy of souls who wants to interfere with the home religion, they may be able to resist it as the reformers resisted this form of governance. And this will uh, 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 call for a close relationship with Jesus Christ, a close walk with Jesus Christ. But then, why did these things happen in dark ages? When you read Daniel chapter 8, the main purpose of the little horn was to obscure the sanctuary message, was to trample upon the truth, so that after interfering with these families, when they come together as a church, it will not be a church of God, but a church that was pure pagan church. And so in trying to maintain a church, they were actually doing away with the church. All these laws they put in place was to maintain religion, but actually in actuality, it was not to maintain religion, but to maintain paganism. And so what kind of preparation do we need to do at such a time as this? This is now home religion. I'm sorry that I started with errors instead of starting with the truth. But I wanted us to go through this short history and see what kind of uh, religion we had in dark ages. And we may see what is coming back and be able to prepare beforehand. Uh, we are told that... Um, uh, the prudent man, I'll just go direct to the Bible now. The prudent man foreseeth, foreseeth danger and hideth himself. This is um, in um, Proverbs, um, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. I'll open Proverbs. 22, we read this. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple person and are punished. In the same chapter of Proverbs chapter 22, we are told, train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so uh, the time we have now is for the wise to understand the crisis before us and prepare for cover. And that part of preparation is preparing our children, training up, them up the way they should go and they will never depart from it even when the crisis breaks. And so what are the kind of preparation that we are talking about? In uh, Manuscript 35, 1891, paragraph 45, this is what we read. Now I want to tell you what, is a, what a saint is. A saint in heaven is just what he is in his own family at home. If he is a Christian at home, he is a Christian in the church. He will be a good Christian in heaven. Now God has placed us on trial here. You notice this, if he is a Christian at home, he is a Christian at church. So we will never have Christians at churches if we don't have Christians at home. And the work of the little horn is to destroy the home Christianity so that when people are not Christians at home, they may come to the church and say we are Christian, but they are nothing. They are not Christian at all. So if he is a Christian at home, he will be a Christian in the church. He will be a good Christian in heaven. So Christianity starts at home. And we are not just talking about Christianity in dealing well with your wife or your children or the neighbors, but Christianity in having true religion, both in the faith, in the spirit, and doctrinally. They are needed at home level. When we are Christians in doctrines, Christians in spirit, and Christian in faith at home, then we shall be all these things in the church and we shall be all these things in heaven. Now God has placed us on trial here. How is it with you? 
Are you going to stand the test? He will bring circumstances around you to prove you and see whether there is any defilement of character in you. If there is any dis any debasement, if there is any can carnality, if there is any satanic tendency, he will bring you over the ground in one way and then he will bring you over the ground in another way and then he will test you upon one point and then he will test you upon another. We are here to be tested and proved. In um, manuscript 48 and 1891 paragraph 4 we read, begin right in your own homes. Begin here to be truly courteous as Christ was. Be kind, live not to please yourselves. Then if you are Christians at home, you will carry the same spirit into the church. You will carry it into your own councils and will have evidence that Jesus is indeed your helper, your stronghold, your front guard, and your rear word. The righteousness of Christ will go before you and the glory of God will be your rear word. Uh, again, in uh, manuscript 36, 1891, paragraph 28. Now, let the parents go to work for their children. Don't let them hear a fretful word spoken in the house. Tell them angels are there watching over them and they must enter into no sinful practice. Tell them the heavenly intelligences are looking upon them and don't allow a word to be spoken from your lips to educate your children in words to dishonor God. Ah, there are scores here that need to be converted on this line. And unless they are converted, they never will know what the love and joy of Christ is in the heart and can never be translated to live with the heavenly family. In, uh, in, uh, in uh, manuscript 36, 1891, this is uh, what we read also there. So Christianity will begin at home. You know, one of the greatest mistakes we have done is to leave our families to elders and pastors to train them and upbring them for us. This is a big, big mistake. And we are told if we have gone through this negligence, we must start all over again to train up our families so that they may be rooted. The reason why we have having a lot of friction in, at family levels, it is because we do not take a Bible as a husband and wife, study out if it is a doctrine, if it is something to believe in, and uh, we have our views brought together, and then we can have a strong foundation as a wife and a husband. That is why the husband goes this way, listen to something, try to come and impose it on the wife, and the wife who have never studied something with the husband sees that this thing is not fitting with me, and then she rebels. Or the wife goes to some place, she studies something, comes back with it at home, tries to implement it, and the husband is like, what are you trying to do? Can we study this thing together and be in one accord because we are a family? If we leave our families to pastors and elders, we are building on a wrong foundation. And uh, this was the dark ages. This was in the dark ages where the clergy controlled the family affairs and stipulated for them what they should believe and what they should do. And this brought about persecution. This brought about a lot of apostasies. This brought a lot of family breakups. If we want to avoid these things, then let us gather our families together. Let the husband and the wife come together. Let them pick a topic. Let them study it out and be able to mesh out their differences. Let them uh, painstakingly and uh, patiently study what they are studying, if it is character, if it's a doctrine, until they are in unison about what they are doing. And if we can have such a strong family foundations, then when we come together as a church, we can have a very solid church, a church that cannot be uh, 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 swayed aside by winds of doctrines or uh, having characters. You see, here we have a husband and wife, they are coming into the church, they don't agree on anything at all at home level. They come in the church and you find the wife or the husband is teaching something and the one who is opposing him or her is the very person that they spend their time together in, in the house. What kind of uselessness is this? That uh, we can carry our differences even into the churches. 
It is because we don't have strong family foundations. That is why we don't have strong church churches. But if the families were strong enough, then we will be having very, very strong churches around us and uh, we will not be having a lot of troubles that we are having. So from uh, manuscripts, manuscript 36, 1891, this is what we read again. You want that faith that works out your salvation after the divine similitude. Why you tell us that by our works we are not saved? Nevertheless, you are not saved by an evil works, but you have that faith that works out a character after this divine similitude. It is a faith that works out a unity of action. But remember what faith is, by the way. Faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So if you have the wrong word of God, you have the wrong faith. If you have the right word of God, you have the right faith. It is a faith that works out a unity of action, brother with a brother, and every hour of your life. If you are standing in living connection with God, you manifest his love. It works in your home life. There is no fretfulness seen in the home if Christ is the peace principle exercised in your soul. There is no and courteousness there. There is no roughness or sharp speech there. Why? Because we believe and act out that uh, we are members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king, bound to Jesus Christ by the strongest love of, tie of love, that love which works by faith and purifies the soul. You love Jesus and you are constantly at work to overcome all selfishness and be a blessing and comfort and strength and a support to the souls he has purchased with his blood. I cannot see why we should not the more honestly try to bring the peace of Christ right into our family than to labor for those that have no living connection with us. But if we have religion in the home, it will extend outside of the home. So we, we are so busy going out for missions, trying to bring people to the truth. And it's not a bad thing to be a field missionary, but we are being told it were better if you brought your family to Christ first before you venture into this issue of uh, going to missions to uh, a proselyte people. And so if you have Christ in your family, then uh, you will, if you have religion in your home, sorry, it will extend outside the home. You will have it everywhere. You will carry it with you to the church. You can carry it with you when you go out to your work. It will be with you wherever you shall be. What we want is religion in the home. What we need is the peace principle which shall control our spirit and our life and character after the Christ life. He has given us his example. God help us that we may walk and work intelligently to this end. There is no virtue in your prayers to God when you get right up from your prayer and begin to speak sharp words and make yourself disagreeable in your family. When you get up from your prayers and begin to fret and to find fault with everything and with God himself, for this has been done, your prayers don't go any higher than your head. Shall we now have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul where, here, where this reformation means so much? Well, that is what we want because the latter rain is coming. We want the vessel all cleansed from it is work of impurity. Now, you understand this latter rain is not coming on anyone who have falsehood, both in character, both doctrinally, because the 144 have no guile in their mouth. They have not uh, uh, polluted themselves with women. This is false religion and the false theories and false beliefs. So this latter rain cannot come to the church and you participate in it when it has not been poured on your family. We, we, we every time talk about the latter rain, the coming of the latter rain to the church. What people forget is that the latter rain is coming to the family before it proceeds to the church. And so uh, th this is backed up by what is written in the book of Malachi. And uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. Malachi chapter, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, and we are told, Behold, I'll send Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And we understand these are the times of the falling of the latter rain going in the 
going in the spirit of Elijah is in the time of uh, the, la the latter rain. The work of Elijah was to bring a reformation in Israel and uh, he went to the families and went to the church and then when he had finished with this, he went on Mount Carmel and there was rain. And so we have the work of Elijah going on at the family level, at the church level, and then it is followed by the latter rain. This is the spirit of Elijah and the working of Elijah. And what will be the work of Elijah? And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And this is twofold. Fathers being turned to their children, uh, the heart of the fathers being turned to their children. This can mean spiritually, doctrinally, and also just socially, reviving those family ties socially, but also uh, uh, the children going back to believing what their fathers believed and the fathers passing the information to their children of what they inherited as their beliefs. And so this is a twofold message, uh, both doctrinally and socially. Elijah is going to revive families. Once we have the families who are, who are having the right view of God, we shall have a church which is revived, and then the Lord will have a ministry sanctified, ready for the latter rain. And so we are urged that the latter rain is coming, but it has come to come to the family level before it comes to the church level. For we will not say that we are participating in the latter rain at the church level, when the church itself starts at home and there is no latter rain at, at the church at home. The first place for the Lord to pour his rain, it is the church at home. We want the vessel to be a vessel unto honor, fit for the master's use. There are vessels to dishonor and there are vessels to honor. Now we want to make our choice and reveal that we choose to be a vessel unto honor. There is not... There is not a quarreling man, no matter if your profession is as high as heaven, nor a quarreling woman, not one that loves to talk and berate and wound and injure the souls and reputation of God's people that will ever enter the portals of the city of God. If you are a quarreling man, if you are a man um, who loves to berate and wound people and injure their souls, it doesn't matter how high your position is, we are told that we shall never enter the portals of the city of God. Why? Because there will be a second rebellion in heaven. What we need now is to be students, to learn in the school of Christ, to perfect a Christ-like character. And this is not perfected in the church first. It is perfected at home. Then we move at the church level. Because the church, that is the building that we meet at with different families and different people, is just an extension of a home church. Without a home church, then we are not having any extension of a church anywhere. Religion is a personal matter. This is MS 35, 1891. Religion is a personal matter. We are not saved by companies. We are not saved by having our names in the church books. We are not saved by numbers. The matter is, how is it with my soul? Have I made the surrender to God? Luke 10. Read the test made to Christ. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Christ responds to the lawyer what is written in the law. How readest thou? Read the whole chapter, the whole on this point. Am I converted to God? Has his transforming power made me a new man? Am I kind? Have I the attributes of Christ or the attributes of Satan? Am I polite to God whose property in souls I am responsible for? This is family life. Those children that you have been given to, this is Jeremiah 13, 20. Have you been responsible for them? And uh, just going to Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 20, uh, this is what uh, we read in Jeremiah 13, verse 20. And uh, I'll highlight it just to be visible enough. Jeremiah 13, 20, Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north, where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? And so here we are asked, am I polite to God whose property in souls I am responsible for? 
where are these little flock that God gave unto you? Have you been responsible for them? You who are saying that you are responsible for a church, have you been responsible to your own family, which is your first church? Am I kind? Am I patient? Am I tender? Do I have the love of Christ for the souls whom he has died? The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will re recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness of it is practical power upon the heart. No wonder we haven't had so much power with people because we haven't had so much power with our own families. If our power will be recognized at a family level, then the sweet influence and the powerful uh, atmosphere will not spread uh, not only in the neighborhood, but in the environs where actually our foods shall set uh, it is sold. Order of family, again in 30 to 94, the order and prosperity of the kingdom depended upon the good order of the church. And the prosperity, harmony, and order of the church depended upon the good order and thorough discipline of families. Now, I wanted us to capture this so well. The order and prosperity of the kingdom depended upon the good order of the church. This is the sequence. Don't think that the kingdom is at high. Look at this. And the prosperity, harmony, and the order of the church depended upon the good order and thorough discipline of the family. So we have thoroughness at the family level. Then this is extended to church level. Then the church extends to the kingdom. Why are we having kingdoms which are depraved? It is because we haven't had a strong foundation for the families. And that is why uh, uh, even in there cannot be a kingdom of God if we have not become brothers and sisters here on earth. And brothers and sisters is a family name. When you call somebody, oh, brother, oh, my sister, what do you mean? You, you don't mean just somebody who has been converted. By the way, we just think it is about people being converted to Christ and then they become our family members. It goes beyond that conversion. It, 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 um, uh, it goes to the extent of understanding that the Heavenly Father is our Father individually and as families. And he has united us together. And by partaking of his spirit, we have partaken of his seed. And you know, brothers and sisters are related by seed. My own sister whom I was born with is my sister because she has the seed of my parents, which also I have, and they are of the same stock. And so if we call ourselves brothers and sisters at church level, we recognize that that brother who has been converted, he is having a seed. The sister is also having a seed, which I'm having. And this is the seed of the father, which is the spirit. And then it has made us one more than just blood sisters and brothers, but are people who have partaken of the same spirit and will never differ again. God punishes the unfaithfulness of parents to whom he has entrusted the duty of maintaining the principles of parental government, which lie at the foundation of church discipline and the prosperity of the nation. So the good foundation of the family uh, set by the parents are the principles that will guide the church and the church will be able to bring forth prosperity to the nation. So if you see a nation being destroyed, then it means it doesn't have a good church. And that which actually it means we don't have good families. And so one undisciplined child has frequently marred the peace and harmony of the church and incited a nation to murmuring and rebellion. Think about that. One child who marks his character brings uh who must the church brings a uh, murmuring to a nation in a most solemn manner the lord has enjoined upon the children their duty to affectionately respect and honor their parents 
And on the other hand, he requires parents to train up their children with an unceasing diligence to educate them with regard to the claims of his law and to in instruct them in the knowledge and fear of God. These injunctions which God laid upon the Jewish with so much solemnity rest with equal weight upon Christian parents. Those who neglect the light and instruction which God has given in his word in regard to training their children and commanding their household after them will have a fearful account to settle. Aaron's criminal neglect to command the respect and reverence of his son resulted in their death. As we close up, we are told uh, that family properly conducted is a favorable argument to the truth and the head of such a family will carry out the very same kind of work in the church as revealed in the family. Wherever severity, harshness, and want of affection and love are exhibited in the sacred sack of the home, there will mostly assuredly be a failure in the plans and management in the church. Unity in the home, unity in the church reveals Christ's manner and grace more than sermons and arguments. The servants of God must not strive but in meekness instruct those who oppose themselves against the truth that they may see the errors of their ways and be converted. But let your light shine in good works, in careful patience, brotherly words, uh, speak to those with whom you associate in good works. Home religion will exert an influence in the neighborhood and in the church. Now, he who is engaged in the work of gospel ministry must be faithful in his family life. It is as essential that as a father, he should improve the talents God has given him for the purpose of making the home a symbol of the heavenly family, as that in the work of the ministry, he should make use of his God-given powers to win souls for the church. Just with much effort that we are doing the work of the church, do it at the family level. Because we are talking of a crisis that is coming, and if our children are not trained in the right way, then they will give in when the dark ages returns upon us. And so we want to make sure that home religion is restored and our children are trained thoroughly, wives and husbands are equipped with the word of God so that when it comes to defending them, it, they can not be ashamed of rightly dividing the word of truth and they can detect paganism and falsehood very easily when it comes to them because they have learned what is the truth. As the priest in the home and as the ambassador of Christ in the church, he should exemplify his life, his, in his life the character of Christ. He must faithfully, he must be faithful in watching for souls as one that must give an account. In his service, there must be seen no carelessness and in attentive work. God will not serve with the sins of men who have not a clear sense of the sacred responsibility involved in accepting a position as a pastor of a church. He who fails to be a faithful, discerning shepherd in the home will surely fail of being a faithful shepherd to the flock of God in the church. The first work of Christians is to be united in the family. Then the work is to be extended. Then the work is to extend to their neighbors nigh and far off. The light we have received upon the third angel's message is the true light. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Not only in regard to this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. But a most solemn work is to be accomplished in a world, and I say at family levels. The Lord's command to his servant is cry aloud and spare, not lift up their voice like a trumpet and show thy people or my people thy transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Now look at this. The next paragraph says in 6017.2, there is to be no change in the general features of our work. It is to stand as clear and distinct as prophecy has made it. We are to enter into no confederacy with the world, supposing that by so doing we could accomplish more. If any stand in the way to hinder the advancement of the work in the lines that God has appointed, they will displease God. No line of truth that, that has made Seventh-day Adventist people what they are is to be weakened. We have the all landmarks of truth, experience, and duty, and we are to stand firmly in defense of our principles in full view of the world. Now, why will I read these statements? Because whatever the Lord gave to Moses, he told him to teach the parents, and the parents had to repeat these things and write them at their doorsteps, recite them when they are going to sleep and when they are waking up, so that the children may be thoroughly educated so that they may avoid the 
the uh the the they are being uh contaminated with the neighboring nations and their heathenism when the children of Israel left following after the truth God had given them, then they were easily ensnared by the neighboring nations. The reason only Adventism can come to fail is because families have failed to do what it should be doing. And so we thoroughly train our families and all this heathenism that is going around us and what is coming back in, with papal power will easily be resisted by the people then. And so let us look at somebody who was trained earlier and how he was able to stand for the truth. Probably no one of the early workers among Seventh-day Adventists exerted more direct influence to win people to the truth than Merit Eton Cornell. He was born in Chile, New York, January 29, 1827. And look at this. And when 10 years of age... I want us to notice this very carefully because you are talking about home religion and how we can be able to stand the sophistry of paganism. And when he was 10 years of age, mark that, removed with his parents to Michigan and settled in Tyrone, Livingston Candle. At an early age, he gave his heart to the Lord and began to preach the Advent doctrine as best as he knew, shortly after the disappointment of 1844. While still young, in his chosen work, he was passing through Jackson, Michigan, and heard Elder Joseph Bates speak on the obligation of the fourth commandment. Accepting the seventh day as the Sabbath, he began it his proclamation and was soon recognized as one of the principal evangelists of this denomination. What age? At the age of 10. Think about the work that the parents had done for this child. By the age of 10, he was able to defend the truth. And an early, at an early age, he was baptized. And he stood, even after the disappointment of 1844, he stood still with the truth. And so in this world where there is a lot of apostasy, will our children be able to stand? If our 10 years old children will be brought before the tribunal to answer for what they believe, will they be able to stand? And ask yourself, why will our children not be able to stand to defend the truth? Because we have thought that church has been appointed to bring up our children, when actually these children should be trained at the family level, so that when they go to the church, it is to strengthen the church and be able to defend that which they have been taught at home. The reason why the Scotch Inquisition and the Roman pagan state were able to get a lot of people on their side on their side is because the families had not been trained to defend the truth and to endure uh, the the pressure of uh, the Roman Empire and so if we are not going to do what we are supposed to do we are going to get our family lost now, it is interesting, this is the last thing I'm reading, that family life and bringing up family is part of the third angel's message. In Child Guidance 558, our closing quote, we read, the special work of parents is to make the laws of God plain to their children and to urge their obedience to them, that they may see the importance of obeying God all the days of their life. This was the work of Moses. Now, hold on, on up there, and we go back to our text in Malachi. The book of Malachi, chapter 4, we read, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Again, remember ye, and remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I'll send you Elijah. So the sending of Elijah is connected with the servant Moses. And the wash, the, 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 this work of Elijah is to restore the people to the statutes and judgments given to Moses, the word of God, and in its injunction. And so 
the outpouring of the latter rain which comes under the Elijah movement or in the spirit of Elijah is to restore what God had taught Moses and the children of Israel. And part of that will include that family life will include the third angel's message. So this was the work of Moses. He was to enjoin upon parents their duty to give their children an example of strict obedience. And this is the work that above everything else must be done in the home life today. The work of Elijah and the work of Moses. It is to accompany the third angel's message. What is the third angel's message? To a Seventh-day Adventist, the message is righteousness by faith. To the world is the mark of the beast versus the seal of God. And so family life is part of the third angel's message. It is to accompany the third angel's message. How important is grounding our families in the truth. We are told this is the third, it is to accompany the third angel's message. Ignorance is no excuse why parents should neglect to teach their children what it means to transgress the law of God. The light is abundant and none need, none need to walk in darkness, none need to be in ignorance. God is as verily our instructor today as he was the teacher of the children of Israel. And all are bound by the most sacred obligation to obey his laws. And so I want to close here and it is apparent, it is evident that we cannot neglect family life at an expense of going to do anything else if we will profess to be educating people on the third angel's message because parenting accompanies the third angel's message. How I pray that uh, we will think of these things and uh, the Lord will give us the strength the wisdom and a designing spirit to know what we ought to do, how to do it and when to do it, so that it may not be said uh, that summer has gone and went and yet we are not yet saved. May the Lord bless us and uh, may we continue studying these things, the family affair, because when we, we, we need to talk about family life, we only uh, touch upon those things of uh, how a husband should love a wife and how a wife should love a husband and all that stuff. It is good, but we are not going to the very foundation of what is family life and how it makes us uh, uh, exclude ourselves from the kingdom of God. But if we will understand family life is part of the third angel's message, it has to come on the third angel's message, then we will start viewing family life in a very different way because if it is to accompany the third angel's message, then it means people have to be taught how they shall escape the mark of the beast and receive the seal of God in the family level. And they should be thoroughly grounded in truth so that even if the church is shaken, that means the corporate thing, the family will remain standing and that will be the church of God. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and uh, may we have uh, 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 an opportunity to go on our knees and uh, a time to reflect how have we led our families and if the crisis will break upon us today as the crisis we read when we are beginning will our families be able to stand and may the lord bless us shall we pray our dear father thank you uh in this hour of visitation lord remember us as you visit your children as a family, as a people, the Lord, we may know what we ought to do, when to do it, and how to do it. May you strengthen the family that makes up the church, Lord, so that uh, at the church level, we may have a people who knows your will and are already uh, are willing to execute it. Bless us and uh, whatever things we have done in our ignorance, Lord, may you forgive us and now teach us the truth and give us the gift of repentance. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.